We welcome you in to the Multifamily Analysis Webinar here on REI USA. I'm Dave Cole, I'm the Sponsor and Affiliate Manager, and I'll be your host and moderator for tonight's event. We are privileged to have Joe James with us. Joe is a CCIM, which as uh, some of you may know, is the highest possible designation you can get in commercial real estate. That's a lot of extra training. He's a commercial broker, but also a developer, a multifamily syndicator, and he's also the CEO and lead coach of ROI Muse, which is a company that's here to provide tools, training, and coaching for commercial and multifamily investors. So he's come to the right place. You as members have come to the right place. Keep your questions in mind as you have them. Uh, you're welcome to enter them in the chat box or send them to me. So we'll uh, kind of keep the questions coming and uh, Joe will let us know. So uh, we welcome everybody on board. And uh, let me uh, also just remind you, of course, we've got a lot going on here at REI USA. Live webinars, webinars uh, pretty much on a weekly basis. Also our online courses and our replays and everything are kept uh, in storage. So there's a lot more on multifamily, even, uh, you know, not maybe not as much as Joe's about to give us, but a lot of that and some of the other aspects of investing. So we do uh, encourage you to take advantage of uh, your membership as much as possible. Anyway, let me get over to Joe and uh, Joe, we welcome you in and uh, our members are very excited to have you with us tonight. Thank you, Dave. Thank you for that introduction. And REI USA, I know Stacy for a long time and you guys are doing awesome job. You know, this is really how we bring value to help everybody grow in their business. So I'm glad uh, to be invited here to do this presentation and happy to be here. Hi everyone, Hi, nice to meet you all virtually. Thank you. All right, we will get started. All right, welcome everyone again, one more time in all different languages possible. And uh, uh, Dave already talked about me. I'm the CEO of ROI Muse. ROI Muse is a company that provides software tools, training and coaching for both real estate agents, commercial brokers and investors. And we have trained over 3000 people using our platform. Uh, we do multifamily syndications, uh, real estate developments, uh, mostly everything on the commercial side, whether office, retail, industrial, multifamily, self-storage and whatnot. All right, so ROI Muse, uh, again, we provide tools, training and coaching. Uh, we also provide free trials uh, and free, free free training as well. So if anybody's interested in that, you can check out ROIMuse.com. Uh, let's talk about why multifamily, right? Why, uh, why you should consider multifamily. I assume a lot of you are single family investors or investors in self-storage or other asset classes. So we'll go through uh, some of the advantages of multifamily or some of the reasons why you should think about multifamily. So number one, uh, we let's talk about, before we talk about multifamily, let's talk about real estate in general, right? Why is real estate an ideal investment? So I have a typo there, sorry about that. So these are the reasons, and you can see, if you look at the first letters, you can see it says ideal, right? So it's income, depreciation, equity, appreciation, and leverage. So let's take a look at each of these. So income, what we're talking about is cash flow from operating the properties, right? So once you buy an income producing property, the income is going to be the name as it indicates is an income producing property there is going to be an income if you write the buy the right property and if you're operating it correctly uh, depreciation is something that irs allows us to do so be, depending on if it's a commercial or uh, residential property you're going to be able to depreciate it on a base you know on a different schedule and also these days we also have advantage of accelerated depreciation and bonus depreciation uh, those are going to uh, offset uh, your income so you it reduces your taxable income uh, that's the purpose of the depreciation and it can also reduce your taxable income and in some cases if you are a real estate professional it may also offset some of your other active income so that's something that you should literally have a conversation with your cpa to see how you can benefit from this uh equity you know your tenants are paying down your mortgage and you're going to be building equity you know as we go along holding the property and then appreciation right there are two kinds of appreciation there is market appreciation which is the based on supply and demand and you know and market dynamics and there's also forced appreciation forced appreciation is where we go in there and renovate the property and then we uh, increase the value of the property by doing renovations and and increasing the rent uh, rents at the property right so the income at the property and obviously leverage uh, you can buy real estate with 20 percent down 25 percent down right so basically you can get uh, financing available to you so those are some of the real advantages of real estate 
And then, you know, what are, and, and then why do we invest, right? Or if you're an investor or if you are an agent, you know, uh, why do your clients invest or why do we invest or why do we want to invest, right? So these are some of the main reasons uh, you want to diversify your portfolio. I know these days there's a lot of crazy stuff going on with crypto and stock market. And, you know, maybe you want to consider diversifying your portfolio, right? Just to be balance that portfolio out. Uh, for self capital, that's number one reason why a lot of people invest in real estate because uh, real estate is a real asset, right? It's not a paper asset like uh, a lot of stocks and bonds and things like that are paper assets, but real estate is a real asset. It's a hard asset. So uh, it basically, it's one of the ways you can preserve your capital, right? For a lot of investors who have already made some money, they want to invest into real estate and so they can preserve their capital and then grow their capital and also get a lot of tax benefits doing that. So, so again, I, like I mentioned, it's a, you know, it's a hedge against inflation. I know there's a lot of chatter about inflation in the market and a lot of money will flow to real assets, you know, <clears throat> like come out, you know, like, you know, like uh, coins and things like that and not bitcoins and things like that, but more of, you know, gold and silver uh, metals, uh, which are real assets and also uh, real estate, right? You know, that's typically what happens when there's concerns about in inflation as well. Uh, tax benefits, and we'll talk about tax benefits in uh, another chart, and also long-term wealth accumulation, right? So real estate, uh, again, is something people want to do this because they want to accumulate wealth over a period of time. It's not a get-rich quick scheme. Uh, real estate investing is very glamorized, so you have to be careful, right? And a lot of people out there pitching so many things and programs and, you know, whatnot, and, you know, uh, it's very glamorized. You know, this is one industry uh, where there's a lot of late night infomercials and things like that. So you just have to associate with the right group of people like REI USA, for example, right? So you have to associate with the right group of people to learn and grow as you go, right? So, and then why do we want to invest in, you know, in commercial and multifamily and you know, self-storage and bigger things? Because you can scale your business faster. When you're doing single family investing, it's going to take you a long time to scale. But once you get into multifamily, uh, you can scale much faster and much, you know, and, you know, uh, grow your wealth much faster as well. So that's one of the literally the reason why you should consider multifamily. Uh, so another way to look at this is, uh, this is Robert Kiyosaki. Uh, he, he talked about this cash flow quadrant, right? So, you know, so you can see there are employees and self-employed business owners and investors. So most of us are going to be on the left side, either employee, we're working for somebody, or we're going to be self-employed. If you're a real estate agent, broker, or even, uh, you know, if you're a single investor, most likely you're self-employed, right? I mean, the way you look at this is, if you can't go to work tomorrow, something happens to you, God forbid something happens to you, is that money going to continue to come, right? And the answer is always no. Like a lot of real estate agents, for example, and commercial brokers think they are in the business, they have a business, but if something happens to them, they are not able to go to work, then that money stops, right? That means that they are self-employed. They don't have a business. So the goal is to go from the left side to the right side, right? So we want to always go towards the business owner and then an investor, right? So ultimately an investor. So what is the business itself? A business is something that you create a system and process and to sell a service or sell a product, right? And, but you're also going to be leveraging other people's money. You're going to leverage other people's time and you're going to leverage other people's talents, right? So literally, you create the system, you create the process, you create the products or services you want to deliver, and then you leverage a lot of people uh, to make that business one. So initially setting up the business, you know, you may be working in the business to set it up. And, but once your business is set up, you can set, you know, you can step out of the business and the business will continue to grow because you've already set up the right people and right processes for that. So, and ultimately, you know, we all want to make a lot of money in the business and then invest that money so we can create passive income, right? So passive income is the goal ultimately. So you, and if you look on the left side, what we are doing is we are trading our time for money, right? As an employee or as a self-employed, we are trading our time for money. And on the right side, we want our money to work for you in the, in the, in the investor column, right? So if you want our money's working for you, then that, is, that means you achieve financial freedom and you know you don't you don't have to go to work if you choose not to go to work all right so what are some of the reasons why multifamily right one number one is larger deals equals you know you get the economies of scale so if you instead of having 10 in 10 individual single family properties having a 10 unit multifamily property you have more purchase power you have more negotiation power and also you know you have you know you 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 know basically you're getting the economies of scale uh, and again you know if you want to run your, your business like a business, the, any commercial property 
uh, whether it's multifamily or any other asset class, will help you get there much faster because now you're forced, right? Because nobody, none of us have enough money to go buy a $10 million property. Maybe you do, but most people don't have enough money to go buy a $1 million property, right? But once you shift that mindset to say, now I can work with other people, I can partner with other people, I can bring in investors in my deal, then that's going to force you to become a business owner, right? So literally going back to the cash flow quadrant, you will be forced to go to the right side very quickly once you start working on commercial and multifamily properties. Uh, relatively low risk compared to other asset classes because at the end of the day, it's housing and everybody needs housing, right? It's one of the basic needs for every human being is housing and shelter and food and clothing. And this is, you know, housing is, you know, is essentially falls into that shelter, right? So it's, com you know, related to, compared to other asset classes, it's, com you know, most investors kind of, you know, perceive this as a lower risk because, you know, you, everybody needs a place to stay. Uh, and then, um, you know, it's less, com you know, less competition compared to single family. I know these days the market is crazy and it's almost impossible to find any, anything reasonably good deal in single family and multifamily. You know, it's also very hot, but, uh, you know, there are very less people looking for multifamily deals because of the specialized knowledge it requires to find and operate and uh, syndicate multifamily deals. Uh, there's plenty of financing options in multifamily, just like single family, you have Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, FHA, bank, and seller financing and other financing options. So there's plenty of financing options available and shorter leases, right? So most of these properties are going to have you know, a few months lease remaining or a year, year of a lease remaining. So that what that means is you can go in there and when those leases turn over, you can go in there and improve the property, right? You don't have to wait a long time. You can literally go in there and improve the property, you know, and increase the rents. And we'll talk about how to increase the value of the property. And opportunity to refinance, take money out. There's a lot of exit strategies. You can refinance and hold, you know, you can buy, renovate, sell, you know, do BRRR, a lot of those options as well. And again, it has all the benefits of uh, of real estate investing, you know, ideal, you know, just the more ideal, right? Income depreciation, equity appreciation leverage is only at a much larger scale, right? So because you can scale much quicker with all, the, all of these advantages as well. All right, so some of the tax benefits, uh, I'm not a CPA and I don't pretend to be one. So make sure you talk to your CPA, your finance advisors about this. So depreciation is usually creates tax, tax deferred income, right? So basically you're, uh, using the depreciation to offset your active or your passive income uh, at these properties. And then you can take advantage if possible with accel accelerated and bonus depreciation. Uh, you can do 1031 exchange. I know there's a lot of talk in the market about the future of 1031 exchange, but right now it's the it's in the books and we can take advantage of tax deferred capital gains through 1031 exchange. Uh, low income tax credit opportunity zones, a lot of cities have incentives for you to come and build housing uh, you know, where they need. So there's a lot of opportunities with uh, tax credits and uh, tax, you know, with a lot of, you know, and opportunity zone and things like that. Uh, then uh, people have, you know, people who have self-directed IRAs, you know, so they can, you know, you can invest from your self-directed IRA. It's easy to find a lot of investors that have a self-directed IRA or solo 401k, things like that, you know, which are tax deferred plans where you can, they want to invest into multifamily deal. Uh, because most, I, in, in my experience, in my opinion, uh, more people are comfortable investing into a multifamily deal as a passive investor uh, compared to doing a single family property, right? A lot of people are looking for long-term five to 10 year hold periods. Uh, so let it let it ride kind of thing, right? So they can get a good, good return on their money. And cash out refi, you know, if you can buy a property with the right price, improve the property, increase the value of the property, you can do a cash out and whatever, the proceeds you get from your cash out is typically tax-free capital, right? Basically, you know, again, discuss with your CPA about what the possibilities are. So uh, to sum it all up, you know, so multifamily allows you to scale your business through partnerships and syndications, right? So, you know, that is something that you have to be open to partnering with others to grow faster. So everybody can, yeah, and it gives you the opportunity to create generational wealth and also achieve your financial freedom faster. So that's literally, to sum it up, why people go from single family to multifamily and commercial investments. All right, so what is stopping you from doing that, right? So once we know the, all of this stuff, so what is stopping you, right? And then, as I mentioned that, you know, we do coaching and training and we talk to a lot of people on a daily basis. For the most part, it is, I don't know how to run the numbers, right? So I don't know, uh, I don't have enough experience and I don't know how to get started and I don't have enough money, right? It usually falls into one of these four categories. I mean, all of these are valid, in, in any given situation, but 
these are all easily solvable, right? So I don't know how to get started. You know, you're part of a REI USA group, right? Literally, there are a lot of people here who can help you. Uh, I don't have enough experience. Again, along the same lines, right? Your coaches and mentors and everybody here who can help you. Uh, I don't know how to run the numbers. You know, that's something may maybe we can teach you how to do that, right? It's not that difficult once you understand the concepts because we have the tools that calculates all the numbers for you. You don't have to worry about uh, doing any of the heavy calculations. You just need to know how to analyze the property, know the concepts and know how, what numbers to use uh, so that, you know, we can calculate the returns and projected returns and all of that stuff. I don't have enough money. You know, I mean, obviously nobody has enough money, right? And most of the time, uh, you know, I, I'm, I've heard Stacy say that, you know, like, you know, and she's never put any of her, her own money into any deals, right? So you had to be open to the idea of that you have a role to play here. You have to find the deal, analyze the deal, put the package together, and then you bring in other investors to invest into your deals. So those are, uh, that's typically how you scale in your real estate business anyway, right? It's not with your money. It's all, you know, we all heard the term is using other people's money is literally the only way to scale in your real estate investment business. All right. So remember this one, obstacle is the way, right? So whatever is stopping you from going to the next level, whether it's not having enough money, not having enough knowledge or not having how to run, the, not knowing how to run the numbers, whatever your obstacle is in your way from going from where you are currently to the next level, right? Is the only path to go forward, right? You have to know how to solve the problem. We are all entrepreneurs. And as entrepreneurs, our number one job is to solve problems. So whatever is standing in your way, you just have to smash right through it, right? So what, you know, you know, so this is literally, there are so many people who can help you get there. You just have to know that, you know, the only path to your, your future is going through those obstacles. All right, so now let's get into a little bit of the math side. So multi, you know, when you come into commercial, uh, deals, you need to know how to analyze deals, which is very important because commercial properties are valued. Residential properties are valued typically based on comps or market analysis, or comparative market analysis. Now we do a CMA, we look at the comps and then come up with a value for the property. Commercial is analyzed differently, right? We do what's called an income capitalization approach, right? So basically we're looking at the income at the property to value the, pro you know, value the property, right? So we're looking at the potential income uh, that can be generated by the property and then we use that and what we call a market cap rate to price the properties, right? So we need to understand how that works. So, so basically, at a, if you learn, when you look at any business, you're going to have operating income because whatever you sell is going to bring some revenue, you know, and then you're going to have operating expenses, right? So operating income minus operating expenses gives you the net operating income, very simple concept, right? And literally that's all there is to know about how to analyze a commercial property, right? Because we, what the goal is to calculate the NOI or the net operating income. NOI in a sense is just operating income minus operating expenses. So let's expand on that framework a little bit because to analyze, we need to be used at slightly different framework because we need to understand the potential of a property, right? How do, so the way we do that is we start with what's called potential rental income. So potential rental income is, this is something very important concept, right? So make sure you write this down. So potential rental income is the maximum a property can generate, you know, if the property is 100% occupied and also leased at market rates, right? So we have to find out what the market rates, market rents are. And if the property is leased at, you know, let's assume we can lease the, all of our units at that market rent, then that is a potential rental income and we are 100% occupied. So that is a concept that a lot, of, a lot of people struggle with, right? So everybody tend to want to look at the past performance of a property. You're going to miss out a lot of opportunities doing that. So you have to know what potential rental income is and the potential, the keyword here is potential, right? So remember that much, potential is a keyword. We are looking at what is the potential for this property, right? So that is one thing that we have to understand first and that we do that by looking at, by looking, by doing market analysis, right? Looking at your competitor set and uh, all of that stuff. And we'll talk about that. And then every property uh, has a loss. Now, most of the time the loss is going to come from vacancy, a turnover vacancy, right? When people, you leave, you know, you may have, you know, property, the unit might be vacant for a month or two before you lease it up. And you're also going to have loss from loss to lease. If you're, if you're, if you're renting your units below the market, then that's called a loss to lease. And then obviously you have loss from bad debt and collections and, you know, concessions and, and things like that. So there are different kinds of losses that can happen at the property. And then, then we also have opportunity for other income. And multifamily actually gives you more opportunity to create other income at the property. So a lot of the time that is literally, deals are getting really tight and tight. So we are looking at proper, you know, properties where there's an opportunity to add other income. Now other income could be something like, you know, pet rent, right? It'd be washer dryer 
uh, laundry facility on site, or it could be washer dryers uh, in the units. It could be you know, cable and internet, like technology package. It could be covered parking. Uh, there are a lot of things, a lot of ways you can actually increase uh, the rents at the property or income at the property by providing more facilities, right? Providing more amenities and things like that. So those are, that's what's other income. And expense recovery income uh, in multifamily, it's called RUBS, R-U-B-S. It stands for Ratio Utility Building System. This is essentially taking some of your expenses, most of the time utilities like water, sewer, trash, et cetera, and billing it back to the tenant, right? So basically the landlord is going to pay for these expenses, but then in addition to their monthly rent, you're also going to send them a bill for the uh, for reimbursing these utility expenses. So that's literally another source of income. So it's an income line. That's why it says income, right? But, but what we are doing is we, we are recovering some of the expense, some of our expenses from the tenants. And then operating expenses, right? Operating expenses is everything that is required to operate the property from property tax, property insurance, you know, your salaries, property management, uh, your repairs and maintenance, contract services like pest control, landscaping, pool service, uh, and everything else, right? So office expenses, marketing expenses, all of that's in a big, that's a big bucket in operating expenses. So that again, brings you back to net operating income. So we went from operating income minus operating expenses equals net operating income to another framework here, which is the one that we are going to use in analyzing multifamily properties. So potential rental income minus losses, plus other income, plus expense recovery income, minus operating expenses, gives you the net operating income, right? So if you remember this framework, if you learn this framework, you can analyze, and I'm not kidding, you can analyze any commercial property, including multifamily, self-storage, or any asset type. You can use the same framework. The same framework is used to analyze a five-unit property, and the same framework is used to analyze a 500-unit property. So this same framework is used to analyze a $200,000 $200, property or a $20 million property or a $50 million property. So this is how it is. This is how commercial valuations are done. So if you understand this framework, you can go after you know hundred million dollar property if you want to, and you know how to analyze that, right? So, but obviously it takes some practice and everything to know the different nuances of different asset classes. But the, but the basics is understanding this framework. Now there are a couple items that are below net operating income, it's not included in that. So anything that's a capital expense, like replacing AC unit or you know maybe a roof replacement, things like that are considered, not considered operating expenses, they're considered capital expenses. So they are not included in the net operating income. The reason why this is so important is this NOI is what's used to calculate the value of the property. And obviously mortgage payments is also not included. So you take the NOI and net operating income minus capital expenses, minus mortgage payments gives you the net cash flow. Right, so literally, that's your cash flow. That's your income at the property. Right, so now we have completed the framework. We own, we know the net operating income, which is used to calculate the value, and then we also know how to calculate the net cash flow, which is your income at the property. Right, uh, so that is essentially the the framework for analyzing any commercial deal. Now let's talk about some of the performance uh, measurements. Uh, so we need to look at how do we calculate the returns at the property. Right, so number one. So we are going to introduce two more frameworks. So if you think about it, what happens when you acquire a property? You have to buy the property. That means you have to do an initial investment, right? Then you are going to hold the property for let's say five years or 10 years or whatever your whole period is, right? Based on whatever your strategy is, maybe it's three years or two years, whatever. So during the whole period, you're going to know how much cash flow is coming from the property. And then at the end of your whole period, you're going to sell the property and then you're going to get the sales proceeds, right? So literally, I'm not going to go through all of this. We just went into details of this one here, but this is very simple, right? You know, you can, you know, it's a purchase price plus any cost, you know, minus the loan amount gives you the initial investment. And when you sell the property, you know, sales price minus any cost minus the loan payoff gives you the sales proceeds, right? It's very simple to calculate this. So we know how to calculate the initial investment of the property based on when we buy the property. We know how to calculate the cash flow at the property each year we hold the property. And we know how to calculate the sales proceeds you know, when you sell the property, right? So based on these, uh, you know, so we know where these are coming from and just pulling them out of these frameworks. And now we can calculate all of our metrics. So value is, uh, you know, or the price of the property is net operating income divided by cap rate, which is literally then net operating is here and cap rate is something that we get from the market. 
right? So once we can know how to calculate the net operating income, we can divide that by the cap rate to calculate the value. And you know, so cap rate and NOI can be also calculated by using the same equation, right? You just, you know, depending on, if you have two of these available to you, you can calculate the third one. That's how this works. Now, then what is cash on cash return? So cash on cash return is calculated based on your initial investment and net cash flow. So you, you know, your net cash flow is coming from here and your initial investment is coming from here. So we know how much money we spent to acquire the property and we know each year how much cash flow is coming from the property, you know, and then you take the cash flow divided by initial investment, you get the cash on cash return, right? So it's very simple to calculate that. And ROI uh, typically in here, this net cash flow, we are also paying the mortgage on top of that, right? So the mortgage has a interest portion and the principal portion, right? So to calculate the true return of the property, we also want to include how much of the equity is being paid down by the principal of the mortgage, right? So we also add that principal portion back, not the entire mortgage payment, only the principal portion back into our cash flow, and then to calculate another metric. So that gives you a true return of the property, right? On to say what is the annual ROI, and typically your ROI will be a higher percentage than your cash on cash return. Right, because you're also paying down the mortgage. Now, the most important metric, uh, in my opinion, is internal rate of return or yield. So most people refer to this as yield, and in the, the technical term is IRR or internal rate of return. And the reason why this is so important is because this is the only metric that, and out of the ones we have looked at so far, that takes into account everything, the full life cycle of a deal, from acquisition to operations, to disposition, right? From I mean, purchase to operations and also the sale of the property. So we we look at the initial investment, we look at the cash flow from for cash flow each year from operations, and we also look at the sales proceeds to calculate this number, right? So this is a little bit more complicated to calculate, but don't worry about it. That's why we have tools for you to calculate that, right? So so that is one metric that everybody should be aware of how to calculate the yield at the property, and because that's how we know how much returns you're going to get. So what we're going to do now is we're going to take a look at the, a quick case study. You know, I'll go through this very quickly. And uh, if you have any questions, we can answer at the end, like they've said. So this, we're going to do a small case study. We've done like 180 unit case studies, you know, 250 unit case studies, or even a fourplex case studies. But I picked this one because I think this one is good to illustrate how, how to do a simple deal. All right, so Sunset Apartments, 16 units. Um, and the target yield or how much our return we want is 15%, right? That is kind of what our investor wants or that's kind of what I, you know, if you are the investor yourself, let's assume you want to get a 15% yield for the property on a five-year hold, hold period. Uh, price, beautiful, right? Price by the market, you know, and then how do we even make an offer if they don't even give you a price? So we'll take a look at that also, how to do that. And then what we have, the data we have is uh, we have the rent roll at the property. And you can see there are 16 units here. We have uh, six one bedroom, six two bedrooms and uh, four three bedroom units. There are some, some uh, five of them are vacant, but everything else is rented here, right? So that data that they gave us, right? We have access to that data is the current rent roll at the property. Now, let me walk you through the steps involved in analyzing uh, multifamily properties. And these are the same steps you will use to analyze any commercial property, right? Step one, we're going to do rent analysis, which is the current rent analysis and also the market rent analysis. Step two, we're going to look at the financial analysis. Then we're looking at the trailing 12 months or the last 12 months of PNL data, profit and loss data. And we're going to analyze that. And then step three, we're going to develop our business plan, right? Because you're going to buy the prop property based on your what you plan to do to the property, right? Based on your analysis and what you see the potential at the property. So we're going to develop a business plan on for operating the property and improving the property, which is usually called as a CapEx plan or CapEx budget. And we are also then based on all of that, we're going to create our pro forma or what we, the projections for the future. And then we're going to underwrite the deal and based on our target yield, depending on how much return you want, you're going to calculate a maximum offer, right? That's step four. And step five is now we're going to test a lot of our assumptions right? because we're making a lot of assumptions along the way. Now we want to test all these assumptions to make sure that if things don't happen the way that we are projecting, you know, then what is the downside? And we also want to see what's the upside, right? You know, and that's why we create what is scenarios. You know, we'll create like best case scenario, worst case scenario, uh, things like that to see if the deal is still, you know, uh, you know, meet some of our criteria. So, and then, Finally, we have to make the decision, right? Go, no go decision. And then you present your deal to your client or your investors right, to see if they'll fund it, 
Uh, and also you present the deal to you, your lenders as well, right? To see if they'll fund it. So that's literally the step one, two, three, four, five, six of what we follow. And again, like I said before, this is the same process you do if you're buying a $200,000 property or if you're buying a $20 million property, it's the same process. All right, so let's look at our case study. So what we did is we took that rent uh, market, uh, our current rent and we summarized it, right? So you can see there are 16 units and these are the average square footage for each of the unit type. And these are the average rents. And we are getting about a dollar six here, right? On the average uh, rents, a dollar six per square feet rent at this property. Now, then what we do is we go out to the market and do market analysis and we pull out comps, right? Now, again, we're talking about comps here, but we are not looking at the price of the property, but we're looking at the rent comps here. So we have identified in this case, nine properties from one property one to property nine. And we are looking at, you know, each of these are very similar, 12 unit to, you know, ours is 16 units. These are the biggest one is 24 units. So they are all within the same range. And we are not comparing a 16 unit property to a 100 unit property, right? So they are all very similar. And we have, we have collected the data uh, for the square footage and the rents for the one bedroom, two bedroom, and three bedroom for each of these properties, right? So now what we're going to do is we're going to summarize that data, right? Our comp data, and then we come up with the market rent summary. So you can see, that you know uh, we have uh, you know the rents here are about dollar sixteen when we look at the market. That's the pro forma rent. Right? These are our current rents at the property. So you can see for the one bedroom we are getting uh, average square footage is uh, you know uh, let me let me go to the next one. We can do side by side. So okay, so this is our current. In the current, if you look at the one bedroom, we are getting seven thirty, right, as an average for our one bedroom units. When we look at the market we think that we can push this to 770 because other properties are getting 770, right? When we look at the two bedroom, we are currently getting 810 and the market data shows us that we can possibly get $900, right? For, for the two bedrooms and so forth and 975 for the three bedroom and the market then shows that we can get $1,100. So this is literally the difference between 1100 and 975 is called the loss to lease because we are currently leasing below market. Now, our next thing we're going to look at is what is your business plan? How do we get to this number or higher, right? You know, maybe something we can even push the rent to 1200, right? If we do some amenities and you know, do some upgrades and things like that. So the part of your analysis is figuring out what can you do to the property to increase the, increase the rents at the property, right? So literally by increasing the rents, it's, you know, that's going to increase your NOI. And when you increase the NOI, the property value goes up, right? So that's why, once, that's why it's very important to understand the whole concept of you know how property valuations are done and the importance of NOI and everything that we do is with one goal is how can we create more NOI how can you increase your net operating income at the property all right so now what we're going to do is we're going to log into our system and then we're going to underwrite this deal all right so all right so this is ROI Muse uh, it's uh, you know ROI Muse.com or app.ROIMuse.com and when you come in here, if you have not, we, you know, you can create, you know, click on the start your trial. It gives you a 15 day, 14 day trial. You can play around with it, you know, see if you like the tool. Now, once you log in, these are all the tools we have. So we have commercial deal analysis, which is what we are going to use today. Uh, then we have commercial lease analysis. If you are a commercial broker or if you, and it's also for investors who invest in office and retail property to understand different lease structures and, you know, how to calculate the value of the lease and so forth. And then we also have residential calculators, the BRRR analysis, the rent analysis, fix and flip analysis. We have the construction rehab estimators. We also have a multifamily pro forma builder and we'll be adding more tools. So these are some of the tools we have. Then we also have some free tools here that you can use for free forever that gives you, that will help you understand some of the financial concepts, right? And we have training for each of these as well, right? So, so those are some of the tools we have. So we're going to go into our commercial deal analysis, which is, you know, you'll just click on access here and go into that. So I've already opened one up here. So this is what it looks like, the commercial deal analysis tool. And I'll walk you through how to analyze this property. So we're not going to focus on this one. This is more for presentation purpose. So we're going to go into the analysis, right? So what is the acquisition price of the property? We have no clue, right? They said price by the market or make an offer. So let's just start with, I'm just going to make a guess that this property is going to be around a million dollars. You know, based on my knowledge of the market. So million dollar is, I'm just going to use that, right? And the acquisition cost, let's say we're going to be spending about 1% for the acquisition cost, which is typically for your inspections and things like that, right? Or due diligence cost. 
So 1% there. And our loan, based on what the lender has given us, is about 75% loan to value. And they're going to be able to do a 4% interest rate and 25-year amortization and a five-year hold, five-year term on the loan. And the loan cost is about 1%, right? So typically 1% is you know, for your appraisal and your origination lender cost and things like that. So those are all in there. Now you can see as much as soon as I put in this information, my initial investment is already calculated for you, right? I showed you the framework, right? Your acquisition price plus your costs minus loan amount is the initial investment. So that's already calculated for you. You don't have to do anything further. Now, how long are we going to hold this property, right? That's a disposition assumptions. And you can see that everything with the gray background is already calculated, right? So you don't have to input that. You are only focus on the white background cells. So we're going to hold this property for five years. And we think that we can sell this at a 6% cap rate, you know, when we sell the property. And it's going to cost us about 7%, 4% to sell the property, commissions and, you know, title and closing costs and everything, right? So we put that in there. Now still, what now what we had to do is we had to look at your operating assumptions. So, so this is your framework, right? We talked about potential rental income minus losses plus other income plus expense recovery income minus expenses. Operating expenses gives you the net operating income, right? So these are all the input fields. Everything below is calculated for you. Uh, yeah, because they are all gray, right? You can see. So let's start building this. Before we build it, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to my rental income worksheet here. And I've already input our case study here. So the 16 units, you can see there are 16 units here. And we know 11 of them are occupied because five of them are vacant. And we know what the market rents are because that's what we did from the market rent analysis. We know what the current rents are because we, are not, we did the summarization of our current rent role. And Basically, what, what it comes down to is our potential rental income, remember that's a potential number, is $173,000, right? Currently, the property is generating $109,000 because of the vacancy and because we are, lo we are leasing below market. Now, the loss right now is 37%. Loss from vacancy and loss to market or loss to lease is 37%, right? So that is a huge potential. This is how millions of dollars are made. So if you find a property that has a number like this, it's going to be your, you know, you, you, you know, this is a, you know, you know, you'll be chopping your lips, right? Because this is a good, possibly a good deal, right? But just looking at the market, the, the rent roll itself. So let's go ahead and take these numbers and start working with it. So save and close. So now you can see those numbers get applied here. And right now it's a 37% loss. Now what we had to do is now we had to you know, let's look at just focus on year one first, right? So year one, there's no other income at the property right now. There is no expense recovery at the property right now. And we know the operating expenses are based on our PNL analysis. It's about $55,000, right? So is the what the current uh, current expenses are at this property. Okay, so we have that much data available to us. So now we can see that everything else is calculated for you, right? So you can go walk, walk, go down this list and see what the, what your returns are. Your Cap rate is 5.4, your cash on cash return is 2.4%, not very good, uh, and so forth. Right? So, so let's go ahead and finish. So if I look at this property and I'm looking at, my returns are not very good at this property, right? Only 2.43% in the cash on cash return side. So how do we, you know, how do we analyze this property so that we can, you know, make sure that we're covering everything, right? Again, you go back to your operating assumption. This is where you're going to put in your business plan. So let's say the, the income is going to go up, go up 3% a year. That's a potential rental income. Market rents are projected to go up 3% a year. Now we can reduce this 30% down to, uh, let's say, you know, 37% down to 30% in year one and maybe to 20% in year two and about 10% in year three. By year three, we have fully stabilized the property, right? And then after that, we'll just keep it at 10% loss because there's always going to be some vacancy and some, you know, some other issues there. Now we can say that other income, we're going to add some parking lots and car covered parking and things like that. And we can get about a thousand dollar other income in year two, nothing in year one, and then maybe 2000 in year three, 3000 in year four and so forth. And for expense recovery, let's say we can also do maybe about you know $500 in expense recovery and then thousand dollars by year two and $2,000 by year three. Right, so maybe we can do some expense recovery or build back and generates more income. Now we also have to look at capital expenses, right? Every property is going to need capital expenses. So let's say we're going to put in $5,000 capital expenses. So typically we do like a $300 per unit. So 16 times 300 is about 4,800. So I'm just rounding it up to say $5,000 for the capital expenses. And we're going to put that throughout the year. 
So now that we are done with all of our analysis, right? you can see everything is calculated here instantly. Now what we have to look at is, okay, what is the price that we want to pay? Let me go ahead and save this. And we look at uh, this deal and we look at, okay, we call the broker and say, okay, we're going to send them offer for a million dollars. And they say, you know, nice try, right? You know, don't even bother, right? Because you're not even close. We have many offers above that. So this is where the target yield analysis, right? So what is our criteria? We want to get at least a 15% return on this property, right? So we know if we want to get a 15% return, we know we can type in here and say 15% and click on this little button next to it to say recalculate the price. And if I did that, it will tell you that I can pay up to $1.8 million to get that 15% yield on this property based on my business plan. Now that is my top line offer, right? 1.7 or 1.8 million dollars. It literally calculated that for you in, you can see that here, you know, 97 milliseconds, right? So now that's my maximum offer. I'm going to make a note of that. And then what I'm going to do is I want to try to see, okay, I want to get a 20% deal. I want to create some cushion for myself, right? I'm going to do 20% and I'm going to look at this and say, say $1.6 million. Okay, what if I go 25%? All right, 1.5. Okay, so I'm going to make an offer for 1.5, right? Because now that is going to give me a 25% yield at the property. And that is more than enough when my investors are looking for 15%, you know, then I can get the remaining yield, right? As the sponsor or the promoter of this deal, right? So, you know, this is when you call the broker and say, okay, we are sending an offer for $1.5 million. Uh, he said, okay, send it over. And then, then he calls you back in two days and say, you know, you know we have many offers you know, and we are asking for the best and final. And, you know, and now you have to think about, okay, how much more do you want to pay? We know that our target yield is 15%, right? So we are getting 25% now. So we have that 10% to play with. So maybe you will come back and say, okay, I'm going to maybe go down to 20% here and calculate the price based on that $1.65 million to say, okay, here's my best and final offer, $1.65 million, right? So this is how you calculate the maximum offer very quickly, even though remember we started with no price, right? We didn't even know what the price was, but we were able to calculate the price, you know, based on how much return we want to get, right? Not based on anything else. Now, now you look at the other metrics to see if does it make sense at all, right? So now one thing we forgot is we also need to add some capital, you know, you know, you know, we're going to also our business plan also calls for improving the units. Right, so we need about hundred thousand dollars to improve the unit. So I'll just make this one hundred thousand dollars because we need to get more capital for that. So now that dropped my return to fifteen point nine, and if I still want to go to eight twenty percent, I'll recalculate the price again, and now it's one point four four three. Right, so now our final offer was revised to one point four three million dollars, and now when you look at the debt service coverage ratio, it's only point nine. We're not getting, we're not generating enough income to pay our loan at the property and the bank is not going to go along with that. Uh, so we either we had to put more down payment here. So if we put 70%, uh, then our yield goes down to 18%, but still our, uh, you know, we're still not making the debt service coverage ratio requirement. So we'll just keep it at 75%. Maybe we can go to the bank and negotiate some interest only. So let's do an interest only for six months and that will get you closer to the 1.2 what the bank wants, right? So maybe, you know, that's literally how you, you can make it work, right? If you want to sue 1.2 as a minimum and we can recalculate that. So now I revise my offer based on the lending available to me to say $1.4 million, right? That's the maximum offer I can make at this property. That will satisfy the bank's requirement. It will satisfy my investor's requirement and it'll satisfy my requirement of how much money I want to make. So that is how you underwrite a property. And it's a very powerful tool. We can you can add pictures and you know a lot of stuff and you can create multiple scenarios and everything very easily right and then uh, i'll show you how to create another scenario here all you need to do is click on uh, click on save as well that okay save as and i'll just call this one worst case just to show it worst case save it and let's say worst case scenario is the market is down we can only sell this at 7% cap rate Right, so now I can see that my return went down a little bit, uh, or let's say worst case scenario, the market is completely down and we can only sell it at 8%, right? So now let me save this one and now we can compare side by side and say in the best case scenario, 
we're going to get a 24%, 20, almost 20, 25% yield. In the worst case scenario, we're still going to make money. We're still going to, our yield is only 12%, but we're not losing money, right? So literally, this is how you want to, you know, you know, test your analysis, right? To say, okay, in the worst case scenario, um, this is a good deal for me because, you know, I mean, obviously my potential is very high. And, but, you know, uh, in the worst case scenario also, I'm not losing money, right? So I'm still making a 12% yield on the property, right? So should be good to go. So that's how you make your decisions based on your analysis. All right, so now we'll go back to continue with our presentation. All right, so how do you split profits? You now we talked about a lot about opportunity to partner with your clients, partner with your investors. So how do we split profits between investors and the sponsors of the deal, right? So this is one example. There are several different models out there. Uh, usually, you know, it's a very simple 80-20 split or 70-30 split, things like that. So 70% of the returns and the cash flow from, you know, operations and from the proceeds, sales proceeds go to the investors, 30% goes to the promoters or 80-20 or you can do it any way you want. It's all negotiable between you and your investors, right? But what we see in a lot of syndications is like 80-20 and things like that. I've also seen 50-50 on smaller deals, right? You know, depending on your investor on how much returns they're looking for and how good the deal is. Now, one of the models that we want to look at is called a preferred return and promote model, right? And I'll show you an example of that. So literally, so this is the cash flow of the deal we are looking at. So we need about $430,000 uh, to buy this property. That's a negative cash flow, right? That's how much money we spent. Then each year, we're going to get this much cash flow. And when you sell the property, you're going to have a $500,000 sales proceeds after you pay back the investor money, right? So this really, we, now we can figure out how to split that money, right? So the one way to do that is, so this is the equity we need, you know, so, this is a one model, right? All of this is negotiable. Let's say the investor is going to put in 90% of the money out of the 430, and we're going to put in 10% of the money, you know, and that could easily be covered by our acquisition fee. I'll show you some of the fees, right? And then, you know, we're going to offer them a 7% return on this deal, preferred return, and then anything excess on top of the 7%, we're going to split it 50 50, right? So that's the model, that's the proposal. And they agree to it. And then at the end of the deal, we're going to split the sales proceeds uh, 80-20 also, right? So this is just one model. All of this is negotiable, right? So this is just an example. Now the potential fees as a deal promoter or, uh, you know, so it could be, you can charge one to 3% acquisition fee. This is a smaller deal. So it's a 3% acquisition fee. So that $37,000 acquisition fee could cover you, almost your 10% in your skin in the game, right? So that is one way to look at it. And if you have construction management, so you're doing a $100,000 construction, if you're going to manage that construction project, manage it, or do the construction manager, you can charge a construction management fee. Uh, you will charge an asset management fee every year because you're managing the property, right? And you're not managing the property, there'll be a property manager, but you're managing the property manager and you're also taking care of the financing and the tax supporting and all of that other stuff. So we can charge a fee for that and you should charge a fee for that. And then when you sell the fee, you can also charge a disposition fee or, uh, and so literally, uh, again, again, this is a, you know, a list of potential things. It doesn't mean that you're going to get all of this at every deal, right? But these are potential uh, in, you know, money you can get at each deal. So you can see now you can potentially in this particular deal, in this example, there's a potential to get about $132,000 of fees, right? And then you're going to get a good return because you also own uh, 20, you know, 10% of the, you know, you own your, your, your own money, making money in the deal, that's a 10%, but you're also getting a 20% split at the back end and things like that, right? So, so literally those are the, some of the ways you make money. And let's walk you through the whole model. So this is the cash flow at the deal. So initially the preferred return is everybody's, you know, the, the investor is going to get $25,000 preferred return based on the 7% of their 389 investment. We get nothing because there's not enough cash flow. There's only 25,000 and we give all of that to them. In year two, we are getting $41,000. So they get $27,000, which is the 7% of that. And then what, we get 7% because we also have some money in the deal, right, 43,000. So we get $3,000. So now the 27 plus three is only 30, right? We have 41. So what do we do with the remaining money? The remaining money is the excess, ca excess cash flow. So that is, we're going to split 50-50, right? That, <clears throat> that's what we propose, right? So you can see now that $10,000, $11,000 is split 50-50 between the investor and promoter. And this investor could be a group of investors, right? And we, we, we one investor or 10 investors. And the promoter could be one person or a team of people, right? Entity, right? Whichever way. And then at the end, when you sell the property, you're going to get the investor is going to get seven seven ninety four. That also includes uh, that also includes the their initial investment of three eighty nine. That's the money back to them plus 
the profit share, and then you're going to get 144. That includes the 43,000 that you put in the deal, plus about $100,000. So you're making about $100,000 at the end of the deal, plus you all, all these fees about $136,000. Like literally, that is how the splits work. You know, for in most, you know, this is a one one way to look at it. So the most important thing is, you know, investors getting get 20, 25, 22 percent return. They wanted 15 percent, right? We are giving them a 22 percent return, and we are getting a 40 percent yield, 41 percent yield, right? So literally, you are almost doubling your money every year by doing deals like that. And then on top of that, you also getting all these fees. You know, that's going to you know help you run your business and also maybe invest into the next deal. Right. So literally, that is how the, that's the power of uh, syndications, right? Syndication doesn't mean that you have to do a 200 unit property with 1000 investors. You can just do it with, you know, two people, you know, two investors or one investor, right? You know, it's, it's all about negotiating that deal uh, because you're finding the deal, you're managing the deal, you know, you're taking care of all of that, right? The investors just want to invest their money and make their money grow. Right? So literally by combining, you know, somebody who has the energy and the know-how and somebody who has the money, this is how we can scale our business very fast. All right, so so give me six hours to chop down a tree and I'll spend the first four hours sharpening the ax. So this is a famous quote from Abraham Lincoln. So uh, somebody told me the other day about, oh, I'll just buy a, you know, well, you know, never mind. So, <laughs> so but the idea here is uh, if you want to do something, you have to spend enough time learning, right? So, I mean, I'm, I applaud all of you to be being here today and being part of REI USA and, things like that, this is how you learn and grow, right? Because first thing is you had to acquire the specialized knowledge, but then you had to do some action with that. Once you have the specialized knowledge, you had to act on it and that's when good things will happen, right? So, but the essence of all of the purpose of all these groups we have here is to literally help you with acquiring that specialized knowledge. So take full advantage of that and I congratulate you for being here today or being part of the group. All right, so back to ROI Muse, um, like I mentioned as before, we provide the software. We are a software company that provides training and coaching, right? So if you want to take a look at our software, if you want to do some, give, give it a trial, uh, you can start a free trial by going to our website. You know, you go to a website and click on free trial and then you can play around with it. Uh, if you want some free training, we also offer some free training on residential. Uh, so we have literally two training tracks. One is for residential and multifamily investments. And uh, and other one is for commercial real estate brokerage. So if any, any of you real estate agents or anybody wants to get into commercial real estate brokerage or commercial real estate training, we also offer that. And these are both free training that we offer, right? So you can also uh, sign up for free training. So go to, uh, you can email support at ROIMuse.com and we can send you the link or uh, we can send you this presentation uh, to Dave and he can distribute it to all of you guys and you can uh, go and, uh, sign up for the free training and free trial uh, if you want to check us out. So that brings us to end of the presentation. And uh, let's see if you have any questions, Dave. Yes, we do. I've got, uh, what, three of them so far. One, I want to move to the top of the list. A great question. I love our members at REI USA. Uh, the question generally, and I'm going to add to it, was about uh, you were going through the, the rent comps. And the question was, you know, what do you look at? How do you get those? And I'm going to add to that. Uh, this was a question I had come up in a separate uh, investors meeting. And as far as getting the investment comps, uh, bringing up other considerations that, you know, there may be other apartment buildings or, you know, rentals down the street or within the half mile radius, but maybe they have a pool and a clubhouse and yours doesn't. Maybe they include utilities and you don't. Maybe they have in-unit laundry and yours does or doesn't or vice versa. You're better, you're not as good for specific reasons. So when you're looking at comps, for this type of project, even using your case study. So where do you get and what should you be looking for in comparison? Oh, no, that's a great question. So one thing I'll tell you that, you know, you can have two properties across from each other. It could be completely different, right? Maybe one is in a better school district, right? Or one, okay. one has a better transportation or one has more amenities, right? So that is why we get paid the big bucks, right? Because that is the unique skill 
for you to, I mean, it's not that difficult, right? I mean, you would literally you have to go visit the properties, talk to them about, you know, get the unit plans and you know, the floor plans and amenities and, you know, look at the pictures. And so you're literally doing, I mean, the way you approach it is first is the main things, right? Is it in the same school district? Is it all similar, right? Is it a similar property or not? So we are picking similar properties to compare, right? And then if you see that another property is getting a higher rent, then you have to ask the question, why is that, right? And then you have to dig deeper and find out why they're getting the higher rent. It could be just simple as they have better operations, right? Sometimes you run into, especially on a 16 unit property owned by a mom and pa operator, they don't want to raise rent. Some of the tenants have been living there for 10 years. They are like, they are in cahoots, right? They don't want to raise rents, you know, or they have not kept up with upgrading the property. They don't even know what the market rents are. So those will be the chachings, but if not, then you're looking at, okay, now they have a pool, like they've said, right? Okay, now can I add a pool, you know, to get the rents higher or how much is that going to cost you? They have nice granite countertops and they have nice appliances and they have nice flooring and nice upgrades in the units. You know, can I do that uh, to get that higher rents? You know, if I do that, will I get the higher rents, right? You know, if I, you know, and then if you decide that you know, if you do that, you're going to get that higher rents, then how much is going to cost you? So that's how you build your business plan by asking those questions, right? And making a judgment based on your analysis to say, okay, now if I can upgrade this unit. So remember I put $100,000 into renovation budget in there. So basically my assumption in that case was I need $100,000 to upgrade these 16 units and also add some exterior amenities, right? Maybe add some, you know, pergola and, you know, nice play area and also in, give the building a nice pop, right? By using some exterior, good exterior color paint and things like that. So, and also add some covered parking, maybe add like, you know, six covered parking or 10 covered parking to get some extra rent. So, so remember I added thousand dollars extra for year two for extra other income. So that was based on, you know, getting some income from the, uh, from the car parking and, you know, resort parking and things like that. So that's literally how we analyze. I mean, the whole idea is to put your business plan together and create a budget for that, right? So for everything that you think you're going to do, it's going to come up with a, have a cost associated with that. And it's going to be a benefit associated with that. So we had to look at the cost benefit analysis and see, does it make sense for you to undertake that upgrade or undertake that additional thing? So that's a great question. That's the whole you know, literally that is essentially what goes into the analysis, right? So market analysis is a very important step and we had to spend enough time to do that. And that's one of the reasons why I tell people, we tell people in our coaching programs to say, focus on one city, right? Because you need to understand the market because if you're all over the place looking at deals all over the country, which is good when you're established, right? When you're starting out, it's better to understand the market, right? Because if you're looking at one market, now I'm in the Dallas market. So you're looking at the Dallas market, I know, I've seen every property in Dallas market, you know, uh, you know, we're looking at 100 unit plus C class properties or B minus properties. I've seen every property in the market. I know of every property in the market. I know what amenities are there. I know how much, how much it costs to operate the property, right? It takes a little bit of experience uh, to get to that level, but you are, that's why another reason why you partner with people who already have experience or you have a coach or a mentor who can help you uh, to get there, right? Because they can look at the, they looked at it several times. They know how, what to look for. So that is, uh, that's how you do it. You know, you have to spend the time analyzing the market you know, properties and comparing it. Okay, one more question and great answer. Very thorough, Joe. Appreciate that. Uh, the last question for tonight is, uh, what do you look for or what should, as a newer investor, uh, what do you look for in terms of property management? Uh, do you go with existing <laughs> Some investors want to do it themselves to save the money, not always a good idea. So what should a newer investor getting into multifamily, what are the big considerations for finding a property management uh, manager? Okay, so that's one of the challenges everybody has. So typically, you know, if you're doing a smaller property, you know, you have, you, everybody has to, you know, go through this, right? Because if you're, because it's not easy to find a property manager for a smaller property, right? Because even if you have a 10 unit property, for example, you, the property manager is not going to make enough money for them to spend a lot of time at your property. You don't have on-site presence. So because you don't have on-site presence, you know, you're going to have a lot of issues, right? Because people, you know, I mean, you have to understand that if you're going after B minus C class properties, you're also dealing with the human aspect of it, right? People have issues, right? And then it all, the, everybody's issue become your issue, right? As the owner, right? If you're managing the property, right? So it's a, always a challenge managing smaller properties. And I've been told not to do it and I did it anyway and got burned, not burned in the sense I didn't get burned, but literally, you know, it kind of, you know, makes it very difficult. Your quality of life definitely would take a, 
you know, take a hit because you're dealing with, you know, 15 families who have issues every day, right? No, it could be simple as somebody parked in my space or my toilet is overflowing or whatever it is, right? So we don't recommend you do management yourself because uh, that's going to take away from your ability to grow your business, right? Now you get stuck in the managing the property. So you should be looking at finding deals, analyzing deals, you know, working with investors and growing your business, not managing the property. So now, you know, what I recommend is if it's possible is look at a, a live-in manager, right? So if you can work out a way that somebody at the property, you know, you hire them or look at your state laws also, right? In some, you know, if you owner, you know, some in some states may have specific law, laws about who can manage a property. So it also check that out. But, uh, you know, what has worked for me is to have a work, you know, a live-in manager, like what we call the QNB, right? Somebody who's going to be sit there, you know, people can, you know, they can coordinate the repairs in up to a certain amount. And they can also, uh, you know, they, you know, they don't, they can't collect rent if they're not in some states, if you're not a licensed agent or a, you know, employee of the owner, you cannot collect rents, but they can, uh, somebody can drop the checks off in their, in their mail slot or whatever, right? So that's one way to do it. Uh, I haven't had much luck with smaller um, for management companies because not their fault, right? Because they're not going to be able to babysit the property for you. Uh, you need somebody uh, on site who's watching over the property for you. So maybe you use a mix, a hybrid approach. So you have a property manager who's going to collect the rents and do the accounting and reporting and everything. But you also have maybe work a deal with somebody in the property to kind of watch over the property, pick up trash and uh, and things like that as well, right? So that is maybe a combination that works better. But that's one reason why a lot of people want to get to a 70 unit plus property, right? Because when you get to a 70 unit plus property, then you can have an on-site management, right? You can have a manager, assistant manager, leasing agent, a porter, a handyman, and everything, you know, on-site, right? So that that removes a lot of that, takes a lot of that away from you, right? So, but I know it's not easy to for everybody to get to a hundred-unit property, but I know that's one of the reasons why people prefer hundred-plus units because the management becomes a lot easier because your staff on-site. Right, that and tenant problems seemingly never happen between nine and five on weekdays either. So mm-hmm. that's another phase. So Joe, great. Yeah, tell, tell me about it, yes. Appreciate all your input and everything tonight. We, I want to get you back here later this year for another webinar. I think we'll get into some other topics since the replay of this will be up and available on our sponsors page for, and any of you that uh, wanted to take another look at those charts and everything, we'll have the replay up in the next few days. So our thanks to Joe James, CCIM for a great presentation tonight. Thanks to those of you who've attended and uh, keep Uh, keep an eye out for more live events and the online courses and everything with REI USA. And uh, Joe, if you want to pop your contact info up there, I don't know if you've got the contact info slide up there real quick. Um, No, I don't have one, but I'll put our support email. So if anybody wants uh, something, you can email email our support team. So I'll put that in the chat. And Dave, I'll send you this presentation and then you can send it out to all of everybody who registered for the yeah any of you that missed it just let us know at rai usa we will get it out there to you and again thank you so much joe and everybody for attending that'll do it for this one and we thank you on behalf of rei usa thank you dave thank you for the opportunity for having here i'm uh, welcome uh, opportunity to come back here in the future and uh, i just put my uh, email in the chat if anybody want to copy that it's support at rymuse.com and then they will get the charts out to you uh, soon. You bet. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. You have a good one now. Uh, You too.